Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jessica Steyer and Dr. Andrea Love. And we are so excited for this week's conversation. <laughs> we are bringing on a special guest who we're honestly, we're best friends. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, we cannot wait to introduce you to him. Um, but we're going to discuss generally um, celebrity health trends that have gone viral. And we're going to kick things off with something that we probably get hundreds of messages about every single week. The full body MRI made popular by Kim Kardashian and a handful of other celebrities. So let's dig in. I'm going to introduce Dr. David Robert Grimes. Uh, we're going to call you David. That's okay, Dr. Grimes? What you like. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Um, Dr. Grimes is a scientist and an author with a keen interest in the public understanding of science. He did doctoral work on ultraviolet radiation physics at Dublin City University and graduated with a PhD in 2011. He did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Oxford focused on medical physics and oncology. He is the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Irrational Ape, Why, Why We Fall for Disinformation, Conspiracy Theories, and Propaganda, with the North American title, Good Thinking, Why Flawed Logic Puts Us All at Risk, and How Critical Thinking Can Save the World. Hear, hear. Um, and it was described as an unstoppable page turner by Richard Dawkins. Uh, Dr. Grimes writes on science and society for outlets including The Guardian, The Irish Times, Scientific American, The Atlantic, The BBC, The Financial Times, and The New York Times. He appears frequently on news media outlets across, excuse me, news outlets across the world to discuss topics as diverse as viral health disinformation to cancer science and gives talks across the world on the importance of evidence in society. He was joint winner of the 2014 Nature Sense About Science Maddox Prize for Standing Up for Science and is an elected fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. David, thank you so much for joining us today. No, thank you very much for having me. And now that you've put that really high bar of accolades, I'm going to live down to them for the rest of the job. <laughs> oh my gosh, we're obsessed with you. All right, so let's let's kick things off. Um, I think a good starting point is sort of the maybe the irony of how people are clamoring to to get these you know full body MRI scans and these other um, things that fall under biohacking, and we're going to talk more about that in a moment. Yet we cannot convince Americans to get their recommended health screenings, um, you know, and, and preventative health is such an uphill battle for us. So there's just, there's like some cognitive dissonance. There's a disconnect um, between these celebrity trends that have been popularized and then recommended uh, public health preventive measures. So Andrea, do you want to kick things off um, maybe with a conversation about the, the wellness industry? Yeah. So, I mean, we've talked about this at length, right? You know, the wellness industry is is not some kind of alternative option that is altruistic compared to medicine. You know, a lot of people say conventional medicine, we're going to call it medicine because it is things that have evidence to support their use. Um, we also talked about, you know, the, the term allopathic medicine, which was coined by the guy who was trying to legitimize homeopathy. Um, so we're not going to use that phrase. But um you know, the the wellness industry, which is a very broad catch all for a lot of things, including, um, you know, um, um, fitness trends and supplements and dietary interventions and direct to consumer testing. Um, it's it's trillions of dollars. Right. So so it's um, one point five trillion dollars estimated um, and it has an annual growth rate of five to ten percent every single year. It's growing very rapidly. Um, so it's certainly not, you know without its profits. Um, we often hear people where they say, oh, well, you know, the, the supplement industry just doesn't have the, the money to do the studies. 
That's not the case. They have plenty of money. The studies have been done. There's no data to demonstrate. So, you know, when you're looking at kind of the wellness industry or the alternative remedy world, um, it's very attractive to a lot of individuals. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how that's kind of made more popular by celebrity endorsement. Um, but it's very challenging, particularly in the U.S., but also in other countries as the growth of social media has given some individuals more voice um, with regard to promoting certain interventions or trends or habits that maybe don't have evidence to support them. Um, you know, when, when you look at people who are subscribing to some of these health hacks or health hack trends compared to those who are getting their routine cancer screenings, going to get their colonoscopy starting at age 45, getting mammograms and and um, uterine cancer screenings, and even things as simple as vaccines, there's often this this huge disparity. Um, so, so David, you know, you're you're not an American, so maybe you can provide some of this outside perspective and context and insight where we see this this disconnect, right? People that are very um, inclined to subscribe to these alternative things. I'm going to use things as a very catch-all, you know phrase here compared to what evidence really suggests that we should be doing you see that that's really interesting to me from my perspective because i am not american but the exact same things you were saying apply through most of europe and indeed through most of the wealthier world and i think that's a really important caveat here this tends to be a indulgence that is more supported by the worried well usually with you know, the wealthy upper middle class people who are the goop generation, if you will, the people to which these things are aspirational products to some degree. Now, screening, and I, I do a lot of research on screening like academically, particularly on cervical cancer screening, it's in incredibly important, but there's no glamour in it. No one goes in, I'm getting my smear or my HPV test, and that's very glamorous, or even my vaccines, not particularly glamorous. Yeah. But there is something aspirational about saying, I forked out $2,500 for an MRI or I'm taking these magical, well-marketed pills, right? Yes. And a lot of this, and we live in the social media era where this stuff is marketed and people are always signaling that it's the same way if you buy a very expensive car, you're sending a signal to the people. status symbol. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so when the Cardassians of this world or the Gwyneth Paltrow's, or I don't want to just single out women here, we could also say the uh, the Alex Joneses, which is mm. a strange company. I've made a The Andrew Huberman's? But, oh, good Lord. Don't even. Uh, uh -oh. I'm going to have to have a lie down if I get on that one. But um, you're absolutely right. So they are selling a product or, or actually, you know, I'm thinking of Joe. Joe Rogan, that's who I was thinking of in the back of my head and I couldn't think of it. Joe Rogan selling things! Um, it, it's, all, it's all the same thing. People want to go, well, that, 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 I associate that with, with I have this insight and this virtue and this wealth, depending on what they want to do. Unfortunately, genuinely effective preventative health measures, like things like, hey, keep a healthy weight, stop smoking, uh, get your vaccinations, attend your screening, it's not as sexy a message, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, it's hard to to put it out there. But it's I think it's because we live in a very performative world, we do, yeah. and that is also yeah. why you're more vulnerable to it too. Like, if and, and, if and I love does that. We all want it, right? right. And, and I love that. I mean, it's not like getting a bristle brush shoved up your vagina is particularly glamorous, right? When you're going to get it your really uh, your pap yeah, your yeah. pap test, right? Yeah, um, Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. You know, you're welcome. But, but let's, so I, I think we, we want to talk about this, but I think, David, you bring up a really important point, which is the cost of this, because this is a very privileged thing. It's a status symbol. So let's just, I just want to break down the cost of this full body MRI scan. And then Andrea, I think I interrupted you. Um, so the, the company that, uh, that uh, Kim Kardashian got her full body MRI scan through was Prenuvo. Um, they charge 2,500 for a full body scan. Um, there's another company, Ezra. They, they charge about 2,000 thousand dollars for a full body scan and then oh, 2400 for the plus package and they claim to this is a quote screen for solid tumors spinal cord abnormalities and degeneration fatty liver disease multiple sclerosis and other conditions to which patients would want to be alerted all right 
How how are we? Sorry, Andrea. What were I interrupted your thought? No, you're fine. You're fine. I mean, first of all, um, there's no evidence to support that these types of really high I'm going to call high throughput. Although in my world, high throughput means a very different thing. But high throughput imaging radiology um, is is actually going to improve health outcomes, right? So you know, as David was saying, it, it really is this status symbol, and and that's often why celebrities are kind of use as these figureheads and we'll talk a little bit more about other trends that we see that in but but essentially you know even the company had said um they don't do paid promotions but they often provide free scans to celebrities if they're gonna they're gonna give them an honest review and i'm using for those who are listening air quotes there um and and then often they do get discount codes so they're literally promoting a product not a preventative health screening and so you know if you look at medical experts, including the American Academy, American College of Radiology, the American College of Preventive Medicine, and the Food and Drug Administration, they all say that there is literally no evidence to suggest that these types of total body screenings is effective, first of all, in identifying medical issues that are not able to be identified through other methods. Um, and it's certainly not cost effective. Um, you know, these things are not covered by insurance. So you're paying out of pocket for this. And the reason they're not covered by insurance is because there's no evidence to support their use. So it's Absolutely. not like insurance providers here in the US are like, well, we don't want to pay for it. Literally, the public health experts and the insurance providers are like, no, there's no evidence to support this. This is why it's not being covered. Um, and so, you know, you have this situation where now it's like this, oh, well, they're preventing us from getting access to this. So we're going to we're going to charge people for it and make it seem like it's something we want to aspire to be able to afford. Um, and then you have, of course, celebrities who are kind of promoting it. And, you know, I mean, if they convince three of their followers to go pay for one, they've they've paid for the one that they've just been given for free, right? And they'll convince a lot more than three. But you raise a really good point. And, and this is um, something that when, when I have to lecture statistics to my undergrad students, comes up an awful lot. People think more testing better, right? And, and this is a misconception that needs to be killed, right? When experts and like the the u.s preventative task force and all that when they are recommending things they are weighing up risks and benefits and you'll notice that their language is supremely caveated it's always about what age group what frequency you should be getting these things and here's the reason why there's a thing that exists called bayes theorem right floats around there and basically people always think a test matters how sensitive it is how likely it is to detect the thing if you have it and how specific it is how likely if you don't have a thing is it going to tell you that you don't have the thing? But what they always forget is prevalence, right? These tests, the, their accuracy to, in, in lay terms is dependent on how prevalent the disease is. And the example I always give my undergrads is I tell them the Western Ink Blood Eliza test for HIV is they say 99.99% accurate. It's actually 99.99% specific, but Let's, for, let's not split hairs, and 100% sensitive. So it's a really good test, 99.99% accurate. You go in, you're a low-risk person, you're not an IV drug user, you go in for your HIV test, and it comes back positive. Now, what are the, what is the probability that you have HIV? And when you ask people, including medical doctors, this question, they tend to go, well, it must be quite high, right? The answer is 50%. And if that has made you go, what? Let me try to break it down with natural frequencies. The bit of information I hid in that was I said you were low risk. The incidence around Europe anyway, I'm not exactly sure if it states, of if, you have, if you're a low risk person and you have HIV, or, uh, you have a one in 10,000 chance of having HIV, right? So if you imagine 10,000 people go in to get screened the day you get screened, one of them has HIV, the test is 100% sensitive, that person flags. But in the remaining 9,999, the test is very, very good, but not perfect. You're going to get one of those people, one in that 9,999, is going to flag a false positive. So now you have two positives, only one of which is a true positive, ergo 50%. Yep. That is not intuitive. Not intuitive at all. But there's a reason why we don't, for example, start mammography earlier in life. Because you'd be sending women that have nothing really wrong with them 
into more and more invasive procedures. Even with cervical screening, the, uh, the American College of Gynecologists changed the recommendation a few years ago. Not now, America has weird things on its annual. In Ireland, we have a national program, same as the yeah. UK. Um, the US is more complicated. I, I'm aware of that. But yeah. It used to be a case that you'd hear people go, well, I'm getting an annual screen. An annual screen is highly not recommended. Yeah. It's usually five years is what the, yeah. the gap in between it. Because even these days, if you get a positive uh, result on your, your cytology, it's still only about a one in six chance that that's actually going to maintain itself as a positive result when you get the colposcopy back. Otherwise, yeah. you'd be sending... Dozens of women in for quite invasive and if it happened, if it, bad, it, it happened to these words, yeah, you know? both of us, for both, <laughs> for both of us, and 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 you know, and this was right around the time that that U.S. Preventive Task Service actually adjusted Changed those guidelines. Years, it used to yeah. be every year, and <laughs> you know, I had an abnormal, got the colposcopy. Um, the colposcopy was you know slightly irregular. I mean, I'll 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 um pair it back for for the the public, but you know, slightly I'm irregular, really but not though. cancer. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, as opposed to using, you know, cancer staging terminology, but, but then, you know, you get several subsequent healthy, you know, normal paps and then, and then, you know, you, you don't need to get them every single year, but, um, right. but you're absolutely right. This, this kind of over screening is very prevalent and, and some of it is coming from public pressure, peer pressure, right. where we're, you know, we're often prescribing or recommending people get imaging done when, when it's not, when it's and not no, there is no radiological basis and, and this is kind of weird for me because my postgraduate is, is medical imaging i'm like there's no goddamn radiological rationale for this like if a doctor sends you in for a scan it is because there is a prior that exactly. indicates you have something they need to look for never do a test unless you know why you're doing a test you wouldn't take a goddamn exam yeah. unless you know why you're taking the exam don't right. do medicine there, there's this obsession, and I know it's an American obsession. It sounds like this is prevalent in other places around the world with information about ourselves and this idea that any information we can get is important information. It's good information. But exactly what we're all saying here, you know, if you do a full body MRI, the chances are, you know, something is going You're to turn up. But weird stuff. Exactly. Yeah, weird stuff. But it doesn't mean that it's clinically relevant, right? Um, and enough to be concerning. And as, as you said, you know, if they find something, then that's going to lead to more more testing and that leads to you know radiation exposure and things that are not potentially not necessary so david i want to just give an example here because the well, um yep yeah, sorry no, i was on, just going to say but you know before maybe you know like somewhere between 15 to 30 percent of people have incidental findings if you get an mri done and so you know if you're if you're doing this on your whole body you know the the rate or the the likelihood of an incidental finding appearing is going to increase. So now you have follow-up tests that are probably not needed. And then you have all of the mental health ramifications of like, oh my God, they found this, this cyst, they found this object, they found this tear, they found this fluid pocket, you know, whatever the case happens to be. And then, and then people are worrying and stressing about things that they probably don't need to be stressing about. And here in the U S you have all of the insurance navigation challenges. I mean, you know, I've gotten MRIs for, for injuries, you know, in acute or chronic injuries and, um, you know, hand, a couple of hamstring tears. I, you know, tore my shoulder out, a rotting bone in my foot, a whole bunch of things. But, you know, every time there's always this like other finding, like my last hip MRI, it's like, oh yeah, you have two herniated discs, um, L4 and L5. And I was like, oh yeah, that's probably an old judo injury that like, you know, reared its ugly head. And I just never got an image because it was asymptomatic. So if it's asymptomatic, why do I, you know, it's not going to progress. Right. It's not, you know, you're just causing undue worry. Well, and that's like when I was in my late 20s, I know, Andrea, you know this, and I, I've probably spoken about this on a uh, past episode. I went in for my um, annual visit and they found a lump in my breast and it ended leading, it led to all this other imaging. I met with a breast surgeon who was right away, and by the way, this is before I had children and I knew I wanted to start a family. And he was right away talking about, um, you know, a double mastectomy and a hysterectomy and all of these things to, you know, because I had some other risk factors, family history, Ashkenazi. Jewish, which is a risk factor, all these other things. And I remember I was 
it, I mean, it, it led to so much undue stress. Long story short, I ended up go, going for genetic testing and all these other things. And it turned out that not cancerous, you know, it was benign. It's something that I'm monitoring, but it triggered exactly as Andrea just said, all these other exams and so much, you know, it really impacted me mentally and emotionally. So there yeah, is yeah. a cost to these things. And, and one of, can I say one other thing? I'm so yeah, sorry, I'm rambling. No, no, we, no. If, if the, the folks listening to this haven't tuned into our um, episode with Dr. Kate uh, Baker, she was she's a, a health policy expert here in the U.S. And, and on that episode, we were talking about this, um, you know, we're we're ordering too many tests here in the U.S. And it's because a lot of our physicians, they're, they're practicing defensive medicine. You know, there's this um, fear of being sued in litigation. So we're over ordering tests. People are showing up to the emergency room because they don't have access to a primary care physician or whatever the, the reasons are for, act, you know, uh, limited access to care. They show up to an ER. The ER doc does not have an established relationship with this patient, doesn't know the full history. So then you're all ordering all of these tests, this is already a big issue for this country. And now you slap on these celebs glamorizing this and making us all think that this is a necessary thing we should be doing. It's very problematic. Sorry, David. No, not at all. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a really brilliant point. So an, a, an adversarial medical legal environment, uh, the States is renowned for it. Weirdly enough, so is Ireland. We actually sue on a similar rate and, and we're outliers in Europe. But I can tell you from the screening service side, it messes up our healthcare because you have people ordering tests you don't need. And then you have people when, you know, things don't get detected screening or weren't present there. You have questions of legal liability and for, for non-negligence, which is which is bizarre. And it's an absolute nightmare. But it does encourage this kind of practice of just throw a bunch of tests at it. But again, if a test is done without a proper rationale for doing it, uh, and unless you and, and this is where the idea of Bayesian priors, not a Bayesian, what's what's the pre-existing probability? Um, and that's not in, and I totally understand why people get flummoxed by that. It's not intuitive. It's uh, it's not even intuitive to people who work in the field. I mean, I work with a lot of medics and physicians, and often I have to gently remind them, hey, 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 yeah, if you do that test now, it's gonna screw everything up because that's gonna give you this this prior. And the other thing you you brought up there about like risk factors. Um, risk, and I think risk is so poorly understood in the public domain that people hear risk is destiny. For example, if you carry BRCA mutations for breast cancer, you are so the, the the base rate in America for a woman being diagnosed with breast cancer by age seventy. And remember, a diagnosis doesn't mean this is going to kill. You. In fact, most of them don't. It's just you know when you live long enough, you get cancer. It's pretty much how the body works. It's about twelve percent. If you have BRCA mutations, it goes between forty-five and eighty percent, right? But that's not 100. And that's the thing. It, risk factors can increase multiple fold relative risk and still be relatively low. But because we don't understand numbers very well, um, even if we're given this information, if someone does, and this is why direct testing, you know, uh, genetic testing, you're like, well, okay, but how do you interpret that result? And yeah. if you don't understand the basis of risk, like when Kim Kardashian did that, that scan, she was like, oh, I have this, this, this. And I was like, but you don't, Firstly, she didn't know what an MRI scan was. She says, it's like an MRI scan. It was an MRI. Oh, MRI. Game that they've existed for some time. Um, I said, it doesn't expose you to radiation. I was like, well, technically it uses radio frequency, which is radiation, but let's not split hairs. Um, yeah, it uses magnets. So it doesn't use ionizing radiation, but let's, let's forgive her for getting that wrong. But even then, if you were to give a risk report, if, if I was to do a random genetic test right now and say I have mutation X, Y, or Z, what does that risk mean in context? That is never a straightforward question, and it's not really something that patients should be trying to interpret for themselves. Yeah. And and you bring up this other point, which which is related to all of these things, which is that, you know, the public, non-scientists, and I like the fact that you brought up medics and physicians, because I think there's this common misconception that they are scientific experts, particularly with it, with regard to statistics and methodology and interpreting data. and that's not the case. And so they may be ordering tests that there's no statistical reason to do. There's no underlying risk factor or, or even relative risk to consider. Um, and it leads to kind of this information overload. But people broadly are really bad at, um, well, the risk perception gap is huge, right? When we mm -hmm. look at people get overly fixated with 
individual things that they want to try and control, right? So an individual food ingredient, an individual additive, an individual chemical, an individual vaccine insert, and they're not good at assessing the risks of things that do have tangible impact like exercise and preventative health and sleep hygiene and limiting alcohol and, and tobacco products and these sorts of things. So they, they, they worry excessively to some degree about these, well, what's in my cookie that I'm going to eat one of today and not have any more for the rest of the week, but not worried about, you know, the fact that you have a completely sedentary lifestyle. Uh, things that we know to be, the one I love uh, a few weeks ago I was out in a pub in very uh, very stereotypical I was out in a pub in Ireland and a guy came up to me and he's like ah oh, yeah now I as you can see here people are watching this is a two liter bottle of Pepsi Max I drink about two of them a day and he went up to me and goes aspartame that'll give you cancer that's he even... me, with a pint in one hand and a cigarette in his mouth and I'm like buddy no it won't and secondly if you want to talk about class one carcinogens you got Correct. two of them on you and Correct. if you're keeping that cocoa, so you're doing in the toilet, maybe add three for cardiovascular. But I didn't say that. I just smiled and said, yeah, you're, you're not right there, but we can talk about that another time. Oh, my goodness. You're a better in person. Love with David. I, I, call it, I call it anybody who says anything about aspartame because I, I have one can of diet soda a day. So I'm not... Yep. I'm not winning this competition, but yeah, there's no evidence. Um, so, you know, but, but the, the, the bigger issue is that celebrities on the whole are now being um, platformed as being experts on what is good for us and what we should be doing. And it's really eroding, mm -hmm. you know, this, this trust in science and this, lit you know, the scientific literacy even more than we're already seeing. Right. Because now it's like, well, you know, well, why, why, you know, I should get this full body MRI, you know, I, I'll save up and I'll do this and I'll buy this supplement and I'll buy this detox thing and I'll, you know, do this and that because, for some reason, there's this, this there's this perception that follower count therefore means credibility, which right. is insane. Um, and the other thing as well is like it's it's a mixture of appeal to authority, which of course is a, is a, is a fallacy, but it tends to affect people with lower health literacy worse, right? Yes, because we see, like you say, a follower count is a proxy of trustworthiness. How many followers did Donald Trump have? I mean, in the millions, right? Let, let's let's talk about. It is not a measure of that at all. And also, this is where I think it, it does bother people. I mean, you're a scientist and you get people coming up to you at random questions. I get in my Instagram inbox or my email questions. Is about this true? I'm like, oh, oh, it's oh, the food babe again, sharing completely yeah. unsubstantiated fear mongering? No, it's not Obviously true. Not. But I also get people asking me super specific questions about stuff that I'm not interested in and no expertise in. They're like, right. well, what about this thing I read about? And I'm like, you know that scientist doesn't cover everything. <laughs> yes. Our, the knowledge we have is very domain specific and i know ex i know what i know and then i know nothing about the vast majority <laughs> of things but you shouldn't take uh, when you hear these people and we were saying just before the recording started we're almost expected to to feign expertise in a wide array of things yeah i often tell people i know nothing about that and i'm not commenting on that or right. i don't know enough to have an informed opinion and a why are you asking random people on social media about this talk to your right. goddamn doctor you lunatic okay he almost cursed, but he, but he oh, stopped himself. Yeah, so, so, so David, I have a question for you. So, um, I mean, we also know the power of anecdotes, right? Yes. And so whenever we are, this topic of full body MRIs comes up, um, the case of Maria Menounos comes up, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. I read it um, in your notes. Already so she, it. yep, yep. So she's a TV presenter, um, and she did this full body Pranuvo, you know, MRI scan and did find a mass on her pancreas. It led to a diagnosis of stage two pancreatic cancer. She was treated for it. It was a very rare, rare form of pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer. Much um, less aggressive form, yeah. Yep. Um, and anyway, I'm, I'm skimming the, the notes that I had on this. But the, but the bottom line is that people were saying, well, if she didn't get the scan, she wouldn't have found the cancer. And, and so why, why aren't we advocating for more of this? It's because it's daft. And it's daft for two reasons. Firstly, she had a prior. She had serious pain and discomfort. They are symptoms. This is no longer. And this is what people forget. It's like, say, with cervical screening. If you're bleeding out your vagina... You have gone way past screening is supposed to take asymptomatic people, the, 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 the ill but healthy or the soon to be ill, but currently healthy. Right. That is how screening is designed to do. Um, what she had was a symptom. 
and she had a scan, which I don't think was actually diagnostic, by the way. I think there's a, there's a, because I, I was trying to look up whether that was a, a way of confirming that. I don't think it is. I think you'd still have to biopsy the tissue. Yeah. And if you had a lot of pain in that area, they'll do that anyway. So it's a bad example for a few reasons, but also it's, it's, it's completely serious. If you went to a convention of national lottery winners and everyone there was thinking sort of how they bought a lottery ticket and won, you would be very much in a survivorship bias situation if you went, wow, everyone wins the lotto, right? Anecdotes are great, but we remember them because they're unusual for the most part. They are presented because they're unusual. So even if that had been entirely asymptomatic and they caught something, that wouldn't be telling you about the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times that they would have sent someone for unnecessary treatment. And that's what people forget in that calculation. Everything in screening, and I, I spend so much time doing this and I lecture on it as well, is risk benefit weighed. And what people forget about screening too is it's a population-based measure, right? Screening overall makes the population healthier. It will, on some occasions, benefit you, but that's not what it's designed to do. It's designed to catch diseases so that overall in a population they're reduced down. And yes, that can be great if you're the one who gets caught with the disease. That's great for you. But people always think it's an individualistic thing. Actually, it's a real public health measure because it's designed to prevent uh, to, to prevent illness in a population i think that is a hard concept for people to to get around their head because like it's my screening like yeah <laughs> but you're a statistic overall we all are okay um and i do want to but it's still beneficial to individuals it's just not actually designed for individuals mm -hmm. and that suddenly gets lost because remember all about social media it's the kind of narcissism of social media it's all about me 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 well, actually, you're part of society. Terrible news for you. Uh, <laughs> and statistics apply to you as well. Yeah. I love that. Andrea, I know you have some other examples that we that we want to get through. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, yeah, I feel like, yeah. So, so you know, we, talk, we talked about kind of this, this unnecessary screening. Dave, David already alluded to these direct-to-consumer genetic testing, which are purported to identify, um, I mean, there's some that even claim to diagnose things. There's, there's only, there's very few FDA-approved direct-to-consumer diagnostics. One is... Coligard, which is a fecal-based screen for uh, colorectal cancer. But most of these things that we're talking about are using like pinpricks or blood samples, and they're claiming to give you like an array of genetic mutations you have and things that you're going to be predisposed to and so on and so forth. And these direct-to-consumer tests are super popular. We already talked about the fake food sensitivity ones on another episode. We talked about the microbiome ones previously. Um, but, you know, they also fall into the realm of like the metabolic biohacking test by companies like Inside Tracker, and they have no standardization or baselines or anything to control for. Or evidence. And that, yeah, or evidence. Um, and, you know, I mean, we got heat by like athletes who were like, well, you know, it told me that I was deficient in X, Y, and Z. And it was like, well, you might have been, but were you symptomatic? Is that clinically relevant? Did you get that validated by actual medical tests? Um, but I think one of the bigger issues is in the infectious disease world, and I love talking about Western blots for various viral and viral and bacterial antigens and antibodies, but it's, you know, we got to talk about Lyme disease because the chronic Lyme world is filled with celebrities who, um, apparently are plagued with chronic Lyme disease across the world in places that Lyme disease does not exist. Um, and they use fake tests and fake treatments um, to essentially legitimize a medical issue that doesn't have evidence to support it. And so, you know, the reason I'm bringing this up is obviously because this, this is kind of a convergence of all of these, these realms. So, you know, Bella Hadid is kind of the most recent example. So I think it was in August where she had an Instagram post and it was like a carousel post. It was a picture of her with an IV getting mystery fluids. Um, who knows what was in there? She she put up several pictures of lab tests that diagnosed her with Lyme disease and a whole bunch of other implausible infections and purportedly has been suffering with Lyme and Bartonella and um, Ehrlichia and, and multiple different things for years, years. Um, so she shared a photo from a test that she supposedly got in 2016 um, that that proves that not only did has she had Lyme since 2016, but basically validating this um, 
what was it, multi-month treatment that she disappeared off the face of the earth to go get done. Um, and, and all of a sudden she's well. So before we get into kind of that, but, but, um, you know, chronic Lyme is used kind of as a scapegoat. So Lyme disease is a legitimate bacterial infection and please just go listen to all the Lyme stuff. But, um, there are a small proportion of people who after antibiotic treatment, when they have legitimate infection with the correct species of bacteria do have persistent symptoms. Um, that is officially called post post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Basically you have post-infection sequelae. This is usually related to the inflammation that was um, elicited by the immune response, trying to fight off the bacteria, because often that presents in more immune privileged sites like the joints where that can last for a period of time. There's, there's not as much blood circulation. So some people experience some symptoms afterwards. It does not mean that you have a persistent infection. It does not mean that the bacteria are dormant. It does not mean that the bacteria have formed cysts. And it does not mean that you need extended treatments, particularly antibiotics or others. So if you're using the term chronic Lyme in the context of you had an acute Lyme infection, you were treated with a standard course of antibiotics, the bacteria were eliminated, but you have some symptoms that last for some months after, okay. But if you're using it to diagnose this generic array of symptoms where you have no evidence that you were ever bitten by the right species of tick, that the tick was infected with the right species of bacteria, and that you were infected with bacteria, that's not appropriate. Um, so so um, the test that she shows is a urine-based test that is looking for PCR, so basically looking for genetic material of 14 different pathogens. So first oh. of all, that's not how microbial diagnostics work. Second of all, none of those infections on this list can be diagnosed through urine. Third of all, um, the vast majority of them are not ever co-transmitted with each other. Um, there's no PCR-based tests that are approved to diagnose Lyme disease and certainly none of the others. Um, but according to this test, um, which, which was highlighted with the marker, very professional, very legitimate. Um, oh, I do she it. had, she had, she had supposedly four different species of Lyme bacteria, which is not what it's testing for. It's looking at genes for three different outer surface proteins of, of one species of bacteria and then another functional protein. Um, again, these are not validated by the FDA for any diagnostic purposes. But on top of the Borrelia burgdorferi, which is what the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, she also had a strain of a bacteria called Bartonella bacilliformis, which is only found in the Andes Mountains in Western South America. Um, at a at between 3,000 and 10,000 feet of elevation, not transmitted by ticks, but transmitted by sand flies. So that that's the other one she got. She also had Bartonella henselli, which another Bartonella bacteria that is not spread by ticks, but spread by fleas or feces that are or scra animal scratches that have flea feces in them. So it's called cat's rats fever sometimes. So she also got that. So she got sand flies. She got black legged tick bite. She got a sand, she got a flea bite too. And she, yeah, no, I know she's really, she's had, she's down on her luck for sure. And she got Ehrlichia chaffiensis, which is transmitted by ticks, but not the same species. It's transmitted by the lone star ticks, not black legged ticks. So she got bitten by a black legged tick that was infected. She got bitten by a lone star tick that had Ehrlichia. She got bitten by a flea that had Bartonella henselli. And she got, she was in the Andes Mountains between 3,000 and 10,000 feet, got bitten by a sand fly, and got Bartonella bacilliformis. And was there a radioactive um, spider somewhere in there as well? Yes, because I for that's sure. That's the so, origin stories of lots of people. I know. So, you know, I mean, Obviously, the likelihood of this, you know, we can talk statistics here, is is zero. I'm going to say it. It's zero. Yeah, the it's risk of this, zero. the likelihood yeah, is zero. Good. So so she got this diagnosis, and then she went through all of these unproven tests, uh, sorry, treatments, IV, possibly IV long-term antibiotics, possibly supplements and diet, who knows what's happening, possibly other things that are touted to treat chronic Lyme, like urotherapy, yeah, urine, um, bee venom, um, um, all sorts of like metal chelation therapies. I mean, there's a whole array of things IV that are reported. Yeah, it's really, yeah. yeah. 
harmful, dangerous, unproven. Anyway, she had no clinical or epidemiological evidence to support this diagnosis in the first place, but she went to these people who are self-appointed Lyme specialists. They charge tons of money for these fake diagnoses using these fake tests. Um, and you know, is she feeling sick? We're not, we're not, we're not arguing that, right? But is it because of maybe this, you know, years and years of treatments? Is it because of something that has similar symptoms to Lyme disease, like depression, maybe malnourishment in her case, maybe um, a, a, a nonspecific viral infection? It, you know, there's these symptoms like fatigue and headache and body aches and lack of energy that are used to kind of self-diagnose with chronic Lyme particularly high rates among celebrities who are very unlikely to be traipsing around in tall grasses, getting tick bites in a, na a relatively narrow range of states in the U.S. where, where Lyme is endemic. Um, so, you know, you've got, you've got this, this, you know, issue and people are like, well, you know, what's the harm? Because she's just doing it to herself. But the issue is these things are harmful but she's platforming it to 56 million followers, right? And, and other celebrities are being the figureheads, right? Chris Maloney, the guy from Law & Order SVU, he's now the face of a fraudulent Lyme adv advocacy organization, you know, um, you know, suggesting that there's no cure for Lyme. It's, back, it's a bacterial infection. There's antibiotics. So definitely a you're, cure for Lyme. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you're legitimizing these fraudulent tests. You're legitimizing this fraudulent diagnosis. You're also making Lyme disease seem like it's more ubiquitous than it actually is. Yes, it's the most common tick-borne illness in the U.S., but it's actually kind of hard to get. It's only, it's about 1% to 5% of tick bites actually result in Lyme, which is an infection with this one species of bacteria. And you need to make sure that the right ticks are present in that area, that those ticks actually have the bacteria in them, that the tick bites you and feeds on you for a certain period of time. And there's all these celebrities nowadays that are claiming that they have chronic Lyme in places in the world that Lyme doesn't exist, like Australia and Africa and South America. Lyme doesn't exist in those places. It, it exists in North America and exists in Europe and like a, a chunk of Europe. It's very rare in UK and Ireland, um, in, in island based countries. Um, it can be found in certain places in, in temperate Asia and Eastern Europe, but you're not finding it in all these other places in the world. And so, you know, you're doing this disservice because there may be a real reason that these people have symptoms, but it's not because of this fake, you know, this, in this case, fake bacterial infection. Um, but then it gets more attention because it's being platformed and all these other people are like, oh my God, I feel I feel like that too. Maybe I have chronic Lyme. I'm going to go buy this urine test at CVS and I'm going to go diagnose myself with Lyme disease. And then they're getting all these unproven and harmful treatments. Um, and because these people are prominent, right? They're celebrities. The media picks this up and it's, it's further legitimizing it. And with the Bella Hadid story, one of my board members at the American um, Lyme Disease Foundation was misquoted. And so I reached out to the reporter to get it corrected. And they were like, oh, well, we'll remove the quote. And I was like, well, do you want to actually address the misinformation about Lyme disease? No, they don't want no, to address it. No, no. It, it, it. That ruins the story, doesn't it? But you actually, I, this is an interesting world that you, that you have to inhabit in this regard, because I made the mistake about 10 years ago of stumbling into the chronic oh, Lyme disease. I'm so community. sorry. Um, now, if I'm not, it was Alan... Alan Steer or Alan Steele who discovered Alan uh, Steer. Well, he yeah. So Alan for a while, didn't he? Um, that was sorry? Some... yes. <laughs> Alan yeah. Steer, um, um, uh, Alan Barber, who's actually one of the people who created the media that we grow that write the big bacteria is called Barber Stoner Kenny um, Kelly um, Media. He, he like it's his namesake. Um, Willie Bergdorfer, Gary Worms are like a lot of these kind of very very um, high profile individuals, both both you know, alive and, and deceased. Um, yeah. I mean, there's been, there's been legal action, violence, lawsuits. It's, it's very, very hostile. So I went into this very naive about eight or nine years ago. And it was something for the girl. And I, I, I had seen this crowdfunder for, and it was a massive crowdfunder to send someone to a clinic. I knew was a crank clinic. And that's what interests me. I'm like, this person has raised 250,000 to go to the States. This is an Irish person to a crank clinic. And because I knew, because I, unfortunately in the cancer space, there's a lot of crank clinics and oh, I've yeah. heard about them before. That's a very tragic and horrible story. Um, I know. Basically, I want to talk more about that later. We will for come sure. back on that. 
but I, I, I knew the clinic and I was like, well, and then I ended up, I hadn't heard of the, the thing for, and then I did my bit of homework and said, hang on, this is a junk basket diagnosis. This is a kaleidoscope of symptoms that people self-identified having. And I went down the rabbit hole because I was writing a piece about it. And I found a bunch of people that described themselves as Lyme literate physicians. They were charlatans of the highest order is the nicest way I can say. Yep. And I wrote a piece essentially to that effect. I still get hate mail to that. It's been almost a Did decade. you get sued? No, yeah. not for that. I got sued for so, something else, but not for this one. So the, <laughs> the, the term, well, the term Lyme literate is a phrase that was coined by this organization called the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society, or ELADS. And they will literally sue anybody that tries to debunk the misinformation. But basically what they do is they have this database of fraudulent practitioners that sell these commercial tests that basically they're fake. They just report positive tests no matter what you throw in the test. Um, and they get kickbacks. The doctors get kickbacks for diagnosing people and prescribing unproven and potentially harmful treatments. Yep. Um, and, and they will go after anybody that tries to call them out. And, you know, even with the ALDF, which is the organization that I'm the executive director of right now, um, you know, we have to be kind of careful the way we phrase things because the, these get... organizations, the ad, the, well, the advocacy organization, I mean, we have, we have zero, we don't, we don't make money. Like I have enough money to keep the website going, but these, these organizations, because they're getting kickbacks from doctors and, um, um, commercial labs and celebrities, they have millions and millions and millions of dollars and they will go after you with, with everything that they can to try and, and basically grind you into the ground. You're going to straight out of the podcast, right? No, no the, but what, what is interesting about it is I talked to patients for the piece, right? And I said, look, and I have zero doubt people are suffering, right? Absolutely zero. But what I'd often ask them is, Right. If you hadn't heard this high profile person X, Y, or Z saying this, would you have gone searching for this as as your reason? And why it resonated with me is that some of my research is also in um, misconceptions around radiotherapy and or sorry, radiation in general. And it, it was interesting to me because a lot of the things being described are described by the what so the community that self describes as the electromagnetic hypersensitivity community. Now Yes. They report a non-specific range of malaise caused by, you know, wireless radiation of any form. So yeah. your cell phones, Well, and often else. chronic Lyme goes along with EMF sensitivity and toxic exactly. mold exactly. and candida yes. overgrowth well, and all of these not real diagnoses. But, was, was, but, but the one thing I will say to caveat that very slightly is that... One of the most interesting things they did with this, and they can do it with radiotherapy, or with, I keep saying radiotherapy, I'm going back into oncology mode, with radiation much easier, are things called uh, provocation studies. And this is the idea. And did you ever watch Better Call Saul, the first season with Chuck in it? It's very yes. like that. That in these studies, you could hide a real um, cell phone, real router, and the people didn't know about it, they didn't report symptoms. You could give them Correct. a placebo one, a sham one, and if they expected it, it, actually, but that's, that's a good example of the nocebo effect. So placebo means I shall please, from Latin, and nocebo is its evil cousin, which is I shall harm. It originally comes down to when people thought they were possessed by the devil, by the medieval church, they would give them a fake relic of a saint. And if they pretended to like spasm and be possessed, they were like, okay, that's in their head. Otherwise, full on normal demonic possession, you're good. But um, that's, this is where the weird history of this stuff comes from. It has a long, long tenure. But that these people are suffering is one thing I do not doubt. But that makes them very vulnerable to charlatans, cranks, and particularly celebrities, because everyone loves a diagnostic label. You said earlier on how much people love to have information about themselves. And a label, like I have this diagnosis, is, is powerful. But I mean, mm -hmm. it's something you also be so cautious of, because I'm like, does that fit the right criteria? It, I, I wonder, and this is going to scale for trouble now, I do wonder, for example, if we have people talk about long COVID and they're trying to get prevalence. I'm like, but are we talking about many different conditions and many different, like, I'm not sure. I say that all, David, I say this all the time. I'm like, or are you feeling this way because we survived a global pandemic and we're going through multiple, you know, geopolitical crises and a collapse of the healthcare infrastructure? Like, is depression an actual symptom of a viral infection or is it the circumstances with which we are living? Or is it a bunch of, and it could be a mixture of all these things, but when they get bumped into one wastebasket, 
it actually dilutes both the treatment that we yes. give people. Look, and even yep. if people are totally psychosomatic, even if this is, I will be the first to tell you that just because something is inverted commas in your head doesn't make it any less real. If you are suffering, sure. you need help for that. And you're not like a malingerer or feigning it. Like anyone who's ever experienced a mental health issue would be like, yeah, no, it might be in my head, but God damn it, it's, it's not great. Yes, it's but so the symptoms right. are real, but it's yeah. not necessarily taking antibiotics. It's getting exactly. mental health exactly. treatment. Exactly. And, and so treatment. I remember early on in the, with the long COVID, I told Jess, I said, this is going to go the way of chronic Lyme. And, and, you know, not to say that there is not a proportion of people that have true post-viral sequelae damage caused by infection. But there are also people, because there's no way to really diagnose this or look for a biomarker or anything, that are attributing symptoms to long COVID that is not actually caused by a viral infection. Yeah. And, and I and I worried about this and we're yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah. So there are so many different examples that we could give of this phenomenon. Um I just want to tell you a list of things that we were considering talking about in this episode and then maybe we can um start to close out by maybe just talking about one one in particular mm -hmm. Andrea I know um we we wanted to chat about but we were talking about um you know IV drips we've talked about before um vaginal sunbath sunbathing cryotherapy coffee enemas. Thank you, Gwyneth. And then urotherapy where people are actually drinking their own urine. So there's, yeah. there's no shortage of this stuff. But, and, and, and yep. conveniently, a lot of those are also touted as treatments for chronic Lyme and for mm -hmm. EMF sensitivity and toxic mold. And a lot of it's these, true. again, the kaleidoscope yep. of symptoms that don't have an actual cause. So, so let's talk about bee sting and ve venom therapy. Anytime I go now to the store, I see so many cosmetics that include, you know, bee venom. Um, and there are all these claims being made. So um, what is it also called? Appy therapy. I don't know if I'm mispronouncing that. Bee venom therapy. It's the medicinal use of bees or bee products. Therapy with bee venom involves receiving up to 40 stings in a session. Um, sometimes people actually have the venom administered by needle or syringe instead of actually being um, stung by bees. Um, but ice is used to numb the skin, reduce pain. Uh, sometimes people are getting multiple sessions in a week. And it's suggested, so, so Gwyneth, I guess, is one of the people who popularized this, but it claims to address inflammation and scarring. Um, also, uh, other claims relate to treating autoimmune disorders, central nervous system diseases, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's um, and other things, uh, different types of cancer, as well as antiviral activity, including supposedly HIV, oh my gosh, and Andrea, as you said, chronic Lyme. And the idea is that repeated stings by bees is going to lead to an inflammatory response, which then like triggers and is counteracted by the immune system's anti-inflammatory response. Andrea, t talk to us. I know you, you've got something to say. I mean, you know, and, and I think, you know, we can differentiate this from like eating native honey and bee pollen, because that's a whole other thing that people claim it like alleviates all sorts of things. But, but um, yeah, so we're talking about things that have bee venom in, in, in them, um, aside from the injections or actually having bees sting you, they, they sometimes, you know, add it to supplements and lotions and serums and things like that. Um, and, and before we maybe get in, this is different than allergy immunotherapy. Therapy, which is basically someone has a legitimate allergic reaction to uh, a, a particular bee venom. And, and these are species specific, right? There's a different venom that's produced by honeybees versus what's produced by wasps. So allergy immunotherapy is using a very small dosage of the allergen, which is the, the substance, the protein usually, um, that triggers the allergic reaction. And by introducing that medically under the supervision of a clinical allergist um, with a very, very standardized dosage in a subsequent procedure, you basically train your immune system to elicit what we call tolerance. So your T cells and your immune system stop having this overreactive response if you did get stung by a bee at a later date. So that's all. That's a medical use that's very different from this new bee venom. Well, I don't want to say it's new because again, it's co-opted by these traditional whatever practices. But the big TLDRs, there's no robust scientific evidence that this is effective for the litany of, of diagnoses. And I checked WebMD because WebMD is usually pretty generous with therapeutic benefits. And even WebMD was like, 
no, there's no evidence that it's going to help with MS or nerve pain or inflammatory conditions or Parkinson's or Lou Gehrig's or whatever the case happens to be. See, my dad used to keep bees, right? That This is why it's so crazy to me. Have you ever been stung by a bee? It's not great, right? And it's also, it's goddamn cruel because a stinger in a bee is attached to their internal organs. It rips out. When it, so you're killing bees for I what know. purpose? I know. It's, I, but it, what's it makes really me very sad. Could, now, I'm, my, my, my response is I... My fear, like, okay, you mightn't start off as allergic to bees, but after a while, if you suddenly got sudden onset anaphylaxis, I reckon, you know, it's not going to cure you much. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, there's obvious risks, right? You know, I mean, even people who don't have allergic reactions to bee venom, they, I think it's like a third of people who have participated in in things that have been documented, so various studies over the years, um, it's like 20, 28%, 29% had anything from mild adverse events like pain, swelling, redness, um, to severe anaphylaxis, potentially even death. Right. And, and, um, that included even topical products. So even like the lotions and the things like rashes, itching, hives, redness, irritation, um, other symptoms, other side effects can also include things like hyperventilation, um, fatigue, loss of appetite, you know, um, neuralgias and pain, um, vomiting and so on. So, um, you know, there was a systematic review that was looking at the risks of B venom therapy. This was in PLOS one and included 145 different studies. And, um, yeah, this was where they published 29% of people reported adverse effects. Um, and if you compare to placebo or mock injection with saline, um, B venom therapy in increased the, the occurrence of adverse events by 261%. Right. Um, so then when you actually look at the evidence, there's really no evidence, right? And so the most, the the majority of studies have been looking at MS because we have a decent population of people that have MS and there's not a lot of really great therapeutic options. So there's a lot of research looking at, you know, alternative modalities to improve quality of life. So um, there was a couple of small clinical trials. Two of them came out in 2005. They looked at bee sting therapy compared to no, no um, additional therapy. And they looked at... Um, you know, data related to MRI, um, relapse of MS symptoms, disability progression, fatigue, and also quality of life. So some subjective measurements. Um, after 24 weeks, there was no difference um, amongst groups. So no benefit of the bee sting therapy. They looked at another, there was another study that looked at um, honeybee venom with people specifically with progressive MS. Um, they said it was safe, um, but you couldn't actually make any conclusions about efficacy. And also there was only nine people in, in that study. Oh, so gosh, you can't so even they, necessarily they say it was safe because there's only nine people. Right. So, oops, sorry, go finish, finish your nope, thought. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, David, right before we hit record, you, we were sort of, you know, talking a little bit. And, and one of the things I think is relevant to this conversation, because undoubtedly after someone, you know, people are listening to this, someone will send us an article that shows, quote unquote, you know, that B venom therapy does improve outcomes, whatever, X, Y, and Z. So can we, can maybe, this is a good place to sort of round out the conversation, this, this idea that you, Anyone can find an article that su that supports, you know, what it is that they're trying to say, but maybe yeah. why that's problematic. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll try. So one of the things that science demands is that you have to evaluate evidence in totality. And also you have to be, as Richard Feynman, I'm paraphrasing him, you have to also know everything that makes the experiment not good. Not just that it gives you the headline you want. The reality is an awful lot of science is provisional and is later on shown to not be true or to not be as as strong as the evidence originally specified. In fact, usually on retesting, that's what you find. And there's lots of reasons for that. Like you mentioned there, the study maybe had nine people in it. That is a probably horrendously underpowered study without a control group. Uh, straight off the bat, flip a coin. You might as well get the answer from that. That's not particularly useful. That at best is exploratory. And even then, I wouldn't consider it particularly good and this is what people get confounded. We all go to PubMed, and you, PubMed? Little PubMed, and you can look up whatever study you want, or Google Scholar, whatever, and you can find a result that seems to fit your Anything. preconception. However, because you're not a subject area, or a subject expert area expert, you don't know what the other studies say. So if I find one study that says baked beans cure cancer, and then 300 saying, actually it doesn't, that was a really bad study, I can't just cling to the one that said the thing I wanted to say, right? This is why we have systematic reviews. Even if you really like baked beans. Even if I really like baked beans. Yeah, exactly. So 
the, the, and this, I understand why this is so confounding because I, I have people come to your studies all the time and go, but what about this? And I'm sure you do too. And you're like, that study is not good. And it's also not reflective of the rest of the evidence base. People hang up on individual studies, but actually you have to look at evidence of tap tally. And that's hard to do. And that is kind of why research is actually a skill. I mean, part of me, and one breath I always tell people, you know, everyone can think like a scientist, which is true, you can. But that often requires knowing what you don't know. And going, I, and, and often I will, I'm, I am a scientist. We don't know everything. I will often email a colleague or someone in a different field and go, look, I'm doing something on this. My understanding is X. And they might write back, oh, no, no, that's wrong. Let me tell you why. And suddenly you go, thank God for that. That saved me an embarrassing thing in public where I would have said something really dumb. Because actually no one can know everything, but even reading science, you can't read it in isolation. And that is why it is so challenging sometimes. Yeah. And it's, and it's also why, you know, it's, it's so frustrating that, you know, we have this rejection of expertise because, you know, you, yes, you could go to PubMed and find something to support whatever you're trying to prove. PubMed does not grade studies on quality. It is a repository. People have conflated PubMed with being like the legitimacy source and it's not it's just a storage receptacle and, and peer review has become a bit like that like peer review just means it is past the basic the yes. basic requirement other scientists went okay that's not the worst thing i've ever seen or that kind of right. makes sense. peer review i'm the peer reviewer i'm an idiot oftentimes i'm missing <laughs> things uh, and everyone is every scientist does it all we're saying is that looks legit and i trust the authors haven't lied we don't right. actually unless we have very good reason to we don't right. tend to go and investigate. We take it on face value. Right. Peer review is the basic standard. It is not right. the final standard. Right. David, I... And it, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. go. No, go on. Andrea, no, go finish your thought. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, you know, and it becomes, it becomes, you know, you know, we want to help educate and debunk, but it's, you know, we can't keep repeating every single time one person sends a singular study. No, this is not an appropriate research model. No, this was done in in vitro. Like, no, yeah, we already addressed why petri dishes are not appropriate. Please go use the database. Like we've explained, you know, and, and at a certain petri dishes, just just yeah. so you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but at a certain point, you know, there 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 are people where they don't, you know, they want to cling to that more than they want to concede that they're. There isn't both sides, right? There's totality of evidence and there's cherry picking. Yeah. Can I give you an yes. example? And also people take things out of context. And I talk about this in the book a lot because I deal with the, I used to deal with the, the cancer cures cannabis movement. Spoiler, oh, it doesn't. Yes. We'll get that another day. But one yeah. of the ones that used to love sending me was crappy lab studies that THC, the psychoactive component in, in cannabis, kills uh, cancer, cancer cells. cells. In petri dishes. Does. So does bleach. So does yeah. water. So the sneezing yeah, on them. At super high out doses. Cancer cells in a body where there's other cells you don't want to kill is a lot more difficult. And THC yeah. is awful for that. So I knew what they were, they, they thought this was a, a smoking gun. And I'm like, no, nope, that just gotcha. shows you don't know how easy it is to kill plated cells. It's really easy. Well, to kill and this is, cells. you know, I mean, my, my world is half infectious disease, half cancer. And it's, and it's so frustrating because yeah, in a Petri dish, Anything can be antimicrobial. Anything can kill cancer. Anything can cause cancer too, right? If you dose something, you know, I mean, if you give cells enough cinnamon, you're going to induce mutations and you're going to, you know, lead to cancer, right? That's not what happens in our bodies, right? And this is this is this common misconception. And, and we see it with people that have terminal degrees like PhDs and MDs, and they use these in vitro or animal studies to sell a supplement or to mm -hmm. prove some point and they have the appeal to authority and they seem credible and it, and it creates this kind of continuing spread of misinformation. So if left unchecked, I think that this podcast would be 10 hours long and David, undoubtedly, we're going to need to have you back because you know that I'll Gwyneth that, and man. Kim and others are going, they're, they're going to be, you know, it's, it's a revolving door of, of these trends, um, celebrity wellness trends and biohacking and stuff. Um, but this was such an amazing conversation. We are so grateful for your time, your expertise. We are such a fan of yours. Um, and I'm dead set on meeting you at a pub. I <laughs> Ideally in Dublin, um, but also here in the States, if that works. <laughs> <laughs> Why not both? Why not both? Oh, love the way you think. Love it. Oh, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure to speak to you both and big fan as well. So.
Super important topics for everyone. It is complex and nuanced. And, you know, our goal is to make sure that you don't get misled by celebrity influencers who unfortunately are promoting bunk science. I'll use a delicate phrase. Um, so thank you, David, for joining us. Um, obviously, this is not the last that we will see of you. Um, and to our listeners, we hope you learned a thing or two. If you want to support our efforts and help us grow the impact of unbiased science, Feel free to support us. You can pick up some snarky merch if you want a shirt that says got aspartame um, or you want your body as a sack of chemicals or whatever the case you want. You can also leave us a donation um, and you can sign up for our newsletter, which is on Substack. It's the unbiasedscipod.substack.com and our website is www.unbiasedscipod.com. And please subscribe to our YouTube where we have video of all of our beautiful faces um, and all of our other social channels at Unbiased Side Pod. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science.